Hello, I'm Gwyneth Jones of the Translator's Studio. We specialize in teaching the art of translation. In this video, I interview Monika Kokoschitska, a conference interpreter. After discussing the differences between translation and interpreting, and between public service interpreting and conference interpreting, Monica tells me about her work as a conference interpreter. She shares a lot of information about what the job of conference interpreter involves and about working as an EU interpreter. We close by discussing the use of artificial intelligence in interpreting and the different skills that you need to be a successful interpreter. If you're wondering about becoming an interpreter, don't miss this interview. Translators, I give you Monika Kokoschitska. Monika, you've been a conference interpreter working in Polish, English and German for over 20 years. Can you tell us the story of how you got into interpreting? I uh, always loved languages, languages and language as such, and philosophy of language and you know the communication part of it and how communication happens. And um, I was born behind the iron, uh, iron Curtain and languages were like, you know, my gateway to the world. We couldn't travel very easily. And it was absolutely amazing when I could access literature and newspapers in the original languages. And I always thought that at some point in my life, I could probably travel to, you know, Western Europe and and then the languages would be very useful, German or English or French. Mm-hmm. But I, to be honest, I never imagined when I was in secondary school, for example, that I would be once doing what I'm doing right now and that my life would be, well, you know, that it would happen in places like the uh, European Parliament or the Court of Justice of the European Union. So I'm very lucky in many ways, but I was also was lucky because I was born at the right time for this <laughs> profession. When I started out, uh, Poland was preparing to, uh, to um, join the European Union and there was a lot of work for interpreters and and I I was basically very fortunate that I met the right people and the environment was very conducive to to me helping people communicate. I studied applied linguistics mm-hmm. and I remember during my studies, uh, sort of halfway through, I didn't really think I would become an interpreter. I thought that I would become a translator. Uh, even though I also did a teaching degree because it's, you know, applied linguistics is quite comprehensive. Um, But I didn't really think that conference interpreting was for me until I tried it because I had thought it's just too fast paced and, and, you know, the adrenaline, I wouldn't be able to cope. And then I tried it. And to be honest, I never looked back. It was just so enjoyable and I absolutely loved it. And um, I was very... I was very lucky again that I had wonderful teachers and very experienced trainers and professional conference interpreters. And it's from them that I got my first jobs. They were very supportive. They were very, uh, very, they were just wonderful people who taught me um, so much. And then I had wonderful colleagues who were also very supportive. We had like, you know, one our circle of people who really wanted to get into the profession. Mm-hmm. So to start with, we didn't really get any jobs. So we were doing, we were doing translation, we were, we were teaching. And then, you know, gradually it became easier and easier because clients got to know us um, and we recommended each other as well. Before we go any further, for anyone who's watching and is a, is a real... St- beginner and they're thinking translation interpreting isn't that the same thing could you briefly tell us the difference between translation and interpretation well some people would tell you that it's essentially the same thing Um, and some people actually do both that's probably important to note but in very simple terms interpreting is communicating a verbal or oral message or signed message obviously you can be a sign language interpreter uh, between 
uh, parties who do not share uh, a common language. Whereas translating is dealing with the with written content. And importantly, interpreting happens live. It could be simultaneous interpreting happening almost at the same time or consecutive interpreting where a speaker pauses and then you get to interpret his or her message. And obviously there are many types of interpreting. It's not just conference interpreting for translation. And I assume, I mean, I'm not really, I don't really specialize in translation, but there is specializations and then you can be, you can be both a translator and interpreter. And if we then dig a little deeper into interpreting, what are the different types of interpreting that you can do? Well, you can be a conference interpreter like myself. Mm-hmm. You can be a public service interpreter, as um, community interpreters are called in the UK, uh, working for hospitals and I think the police. You can be a court interpreter, uh, working for the courts. And um, you, if, if you think about it, it's all a matter of setting. So conference interpreting is more about international meetings and conference settings, whereas public service is more intimate, I think. And um, the same goes for the police. It's, it's more liaison, I think. You uh, you don't you, you get to interact with your speakers and your listeners a bit more than in a conference setting where you are in a booth, for example. If you wish to work for the EU, you have to go through a, a process and you have to take an exam, etc. And uh, if you want to work for the courts, I'm not entirely sure what the pathway you would have to take is. Uh, but if you wish to work for international courts, then it all depends whether they are in the UN system, then you need to take the UN exam mm-hmm. or um, you can be on the joint list for the EU and the UN when sometimes they sort of they I remember I was once recruited by um, a an international court in The Hague through the EU system because they um they contacted me via the common list so there's like a I'm not entirely sure how that works but you just tick a box uh, if you if you're EU accredited and you t- I remember I ticked a box um which which basically meant that I'm happy for other institutions outside the EU to contact me and offer me uh, assignments. That's interesting. Um, so it's if yeah, one body has approved you, and they will take that as as approved, and so then you can go and work for the other body without having to go through the only approval for process. certain only for certain assignments and for certain languages because. Okay. For the UN, for example, there's only six official language and, uh, languages, and Polish is not one of them. Mm-hmm. So they don't have, they don't re- do UN exams for Polish interpreters, mm-hmm. but can still work for the UN in some meetings if they have a need for you. I know that in within the EU, to maybe make it easier to express, do you want to explain about the how the languages are? Is grading the right word? The A classified, classified. Yeah. Yes, language classification. So let me just explain. So the A language, like ABC, A language is your native language, whatever you call it, you know, language of your education or the language into which you work and you feel most comfortable with. You can express almost anything. You don't have to know every word because obviously that's impossible. There's so many expert fields. But this is the language you feel at home. I think that's that's the most important distinction where you feel at home. It's like wearing slippers, you know, it's like, it's really comfortable. You can express every feeling and every emotion and, and every, um, you can follow the logic of everything and you can just express yourselves in the right way, etc. And there's your B language, not, you don't have to have a B language, by the way, Mm -hmm. you could have a B language, your active foreign language into which you work and you need to be very comfortable expressing yourself in that B language but it's not the same as your native language Mm -hmm. you're a guest in that language so you're still there in that building but you're just a guest so you're probably not wearing slippers but you're probably wearing 
I don't know, <laughs> ballerinas or, or <laughs> not necessarily high heels because high heels is reserved for, for me, it's German. It's my C language, passive. So the C language is one um, that you use for work purposes out of which you work from. I work from German only into Polish, my native language. I don't work from German as my C language into my B, meaning English. Okay, so you can't, you not many people have more than one A language. And very, it's very rare. And you can't work from C to B, although you might work from A to B. Yes, you, 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 if you have a B, you work from A to B. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you have a C, meaning your a passive language, you would normally work from a C into your A. It may happen that some people work from their C into B. I mean, in, in the end, this isn't a feelings thing. I imagine you're taking tests that actually yes. grade you into into these levels. Well, yes, if you work, if you want to work for the EU, for example, mm, yeah. um, or the UN. Uh, but normally, in the market, you don't. You can you can just declare, "I work into English," "I work into German," uh, which comes with certain complications sometimes, or sometimes people very many clients don't really understand i mean they just see for example they see me on the website on the uh, IEC website the website of the international association of conference interpreters they've got like a database and directory and they see that i've got english and german and polish and they think that you know i can work you know whichever which way, way. yes yeah. uh, which is not really the case but yes if you wish to work for the institutions for the institutional market there is a formal exam and then you're classified as A, B or C. So let's talk a little bit now specifically about, about your work as a conference interpreter. What does a day in the life look like as a conference interpreter? I I have to say that every day can be different, obviously, just like in any job, I suppose. Uh, but interpreting, most people think that interpreting is just interpreting. You know, sit in the booth and you just interpret and you, you talk and talk and talk, which is not really the case because a huge part of uh, your job is preparation. So any meeting you do, you have to prepare for it quite extensively most of the time, unless you know that you're very familiar with your client or uh, it's a subject that you just you just know really very very well and you work for another client but you just you just need to prepare uh, bits and pieces but really you know the, the industry very well so you need to prepare very well you need to prepare the terminology uh, you need to uh, read up on what a specific company does and you need to look at the other comp competitors for example and how, how do you know what terminology is likely to come up Let's say you're working for um, apple growers mm -hmm. and you would normally uh, be recruited and then you would ask for documents for that specific meeting. And you, it may seem uh, daunting because you don't know much about apples except, you know, you know which taste you like, you know, whether it's gala or something else. Um, <laughs> but you don't really understand how the industry works. So you have to read up on that and you look at the website. And then you ask for the documents, as I said, and then you have to look at the documents and uh, look up words, basically. You, you, you look at the terminology that they use. It may well be that the meeting won't be very technical. They might not even talk about apples that much. They might talk about business matters. Or mm -hmm. um, I remember I did a series of meetings when there was a, a, bit, a huge international bank taking over a Polish bank. And I really, I remember I, you know, I really studied hard and I, you know, all the banking terms, it was very early in my career. So I really didn't know that much about banking, but I took the job because they said, oh, it's not going to be really about banking or, you know, whatever hedge, hedge, hedge funds or whatever, but it's going to be about uh, HR matters. And it was, it was really, basically they were laying people off and they, it, those were exit interviews. And it was a uh, it was great fun for me as a professional. It wasn't great fun for the uh, for the for the clients, but hey, yeah. you know, that's just so you can imagine. Yeah. Anyway, just going back to the apples. So you would uh, you would look at the website and you would look at the documents. You would compare. You need to make sure that you um, check all the uh, uh, proper names 
and the names of their competitors. And for example, if they are part of any federations, associations, etc., if there are any major issues and challenges for the industry, for example, I don't know, supply chains, or um, there might be, it's probably good a good idea to look at, um, you know, even like diseases, um, pest control, and things like that, and soil, etc. So you would read up a lot about apples, um, read, read up on apples, and then you would you would look at parallel texts you know apples in german right. yeah apples, parallel Korean. text being an equivalent text in, yes. in the other language yes. it doesn't have to be translation the websites mm -hmm. are very good because if the if um if the company has um, a multilingual website it's usually very helpful however they are really localized so not every part of the website in english will be translated into polish for example so you need to be careful and you will probably have to look at a number of companies' website. You know, it's, it's not just one. And, yep, and so the preparation is key. But... It's a lot. I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, but where do you draw the line? Because, for instance, you're not going to learn everything about, I mean, impossible to learn everything about any, you know, whatever industry comes up. Is there some kind of time frame that you work with if you know you're going for an hours meeting is there a certain number of hours that you would give yourself to prepare for it you can't really tell mm -hmm. um, you just need to with experience you you know when you're sort of ready mm -hmm. and you can predict I would say um, a very significant part of the vocabulary that will come up Okay. And you need to make sure that you have the proper names. And it's a good idea to actually look at YouTube and, you know, some recordings of uh, speakers that you can see in the speakers list. Um, you absolutely need to insist on the agenda so that you know what points are going to come up and who the speakers okay. are. And then you probably look at um, some recordings and you just, you know, you're familiarize with yourself with the accents, etc. Where do you draw the line? Well... You never have unlimited time resources, obviously. You need to prepare for other jobs as well. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on your experience and on whether you have done any similar meetings in the past about, I don't know, pears or, you know, I, I did beets, for example. Uh -huh. so, you know, <laughs> you just know that there are certain associations and you can sort of make a certain connections. And it's good to have um, colleagues or experts in the family uh, or, you know, someone you know you can consult. And sometimes I remember I actually, you know, ask people to talk to me, you know, out of the blue, I email people and ask, well, you're an expert. Can you please tell me what this means or that means? And it's good to talk to your clients because your clients may have glossaries mm -hmm. that you need. And some of them are more aware of, um, of what is required for you to do a good job and it's in their interest to make sure that you can provide quality interpreting for them mm -hmm. so that they for example provide you with a, a list of acronyms I always ask my husband for that I mean he's very very well trained now he works he's not an interpreter he's in technology and when he, he needed interpreters he got a long list of things that interpreters need from me and I remember that I recommended some colleagues and I remember them saying to me wow I mean he really is very nice isn't he he thought of everything I said he did and I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's always unpredictable so there are many unknowns with any kind of meeting you want to minimize the unknowns mm -hmm. and uh, the line needs to be drawn where you just fed up mm -hmm. or you just feel okay I'll be fine um and it's hard to say, really. But there's also the, don't forget, it's just, it's not just this. It's also the logistics of it. Travel involved, um, making sure that you've got your hotel sorted out, that the client, that the client knows where you are, or, or maybe they booked a hotel. You just need to make sure that all is sorted. And during the pandemic, it was a bit of a nightmare because, you know, there's lots of like stacks of paper that you needed and you need to make, make sure that the client usually an international institution, make sure that, you know, they give you certificates, etc. cetera. So, um, so that's preparation. And what kind of percentage of your time would, would you, would come under the preparation banner of your it's working time? It's a very good time? question, actually, because when you take a job, 
before you take a job, you need to make sure that you understand what's it, what it involves. And if, it, if it's too difficult, in a sense that if it would require too much preparation for you, and if it's just a one-hour meeting mm-hmm. and you have to travel for like 12 hours and then you have to prepare for two weeks, I remember mm-hmm. conference. I remember studying. Um, there were, that was a medical conference, and I remember studying for like two weeks. So I don't normally now work at medical conferences because it just takes up too much of my time, and I don't think I'll do a good enough job anyway. Even if I, even if I prepare sometimes for a long time, and um, I'm not as good as my um, colleagues who are doctors and interpreters. Mm-hmm. okay I'll do a good good enough job maybe but I'd rather be very good if you see what I mean mm-hmm. um, so um, sometimes it's not worth it so do interpreters tend to specialize yes well obviously we are generalists there's not enough of us to you know there's not enough engineers among interpreters to do just technical jobs or mm. doctors um, but if you're, for example, if you're a medical interpreter, you you tend to, it you you're you're part of a, a small circle of interpreters that actually specialize in medicine. So, for example, if I I'm approached by a client from this kind of interest industry, I know who to recommend. Some of us feel more comfortable with technical subjects. Some never do IT. Mm-hmm. But every time you need to prepare. And you you need to make sure that you've got the documents, and you can prepare for pretty much everything. So you know, I I did conferences on um, European bison, for example. Oh, well, I yeah. that thing, you know, or the elk, or, or as I said, the beets, and I remember all the weevils, and you know, the potatoes, etc., and the differences between um, different kinds of vegetables and, you know, how you grow them. So you need to learn because there are no other people. I mean, there's no, not enough interpreters who would specialize in agriculture. Do you see what I mean? And if you work for the EU, for example, you need to be a specialist in everything really, <laughs> because for every meeting, obviously you get, get the documents, but it, you can, in, during one day or one week, you can be in different committees um foreign affairs legal affairs fisheries anything can happen and in the morning you can be in fisheries and in the afternoon you can be in foreign affairs so you need to be able to switch so that's preparation but then your actual job that is what people think is your actual job is interpreting and a typical day is well for me it would be a booth so you have to make sure that you don't cut it too far and you arrive in plenty of time before the meeting starts. Uh, make sure that you've got all your documents and uh, you've, you've got access to Wi-Fi, you've got access to the documents that may be coming in during the meeting. Um, I work mostly for the European Union anyway. So I, I've got certain routines that I always follow and I've got a list, you know, checklist. Do you have this? Do I have that? And then obviously you, you need to talk to your colleagues and maybe you go through the day and you look at the list of speakers and you can see which languages they probably will speak. For example, uh, the chair person may be French, but they are known for um, the, um, well, I, how should I put it, um, the, their willingness to speak English. Or there might be an Austrian delegate who is, well, MEP, for example, that is not really, I mean, they, they, their native language is French because they are French, but they live in Austria and they represent Austria. So you need to be aware of those things. And then you probably talk to your colleagues about who does what. Mm-hmm. You take turns, but it all depends on the languages that are spoken. So sometimes, for example, if I got German and my colleagues don't, I work, I'll be working from German and it could be for like half an hour, even though we normally take turns a bit more often. Mm-hmm. So that's this. And then obviously you have breaks and and then you just need to make sure that you don't dwell too much on your mistakes. And then after the meeting, you can ruminate and, and worry and, and cry. Well, because thinking about mistakes, I think it's impo- it's impossible that you're not going to make them. It's impossible that you're going to be prepared for every bit of terminology. And even if you have it in all your notes, maybe you can't get your hands on it quickly enough. And so 
what are the are there consequences? <laughs> Depends on the kind of mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Your notes, that's what you said is really, really important. You need to make sure that your notes are there, you know, just somewhere where you can access them very, very easily. That's actually a very important part of your job because there's no time to look for mm-hmm. notes. You just need to make have them ready. However, there may be, um, it may well happen that the speaker quotes from a document that you don't have mm-hmm. available just like that so it's really important that you have your colleagues helping you writing down uh numbers for example oh okay so you're actually you're kind of you've got someone sitting next to you who's working with you to help you yes not all the time Mm. but interpreting is always teamwork Mm -hmm. part of a team and it's actually i i love this thing this Mm -hmm. aspect of interpreting you're part of a team you've got your colleagues there if you make a mistake well you obviously if you you correct yourself if you if you're aware of having made that mistake if it's a grammar mistake well you just you just get on with it Mm -hmm. don't think about it too much you can correct yourself if you have time or if you actually noticed that you made a mistake and if it's a serious mistake like you said i don't know the um second world war uh, broke out in 1940 and obviously it was 1939 it might be the speaker that makes a mistake Mm -hmm. So it's a difficult decision then if you correct the speaker or not. Mm -hmm. And it mistakes all happen all all the time. I mean, that's, that's part of the job. That's normal. Um, Okay. Not all the time, not always, but they do happen. It's, 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 it's actually part of the job. So the way you deal with the mistakes is really important. You can't dwell on them while you are interpreting because it may paralyze you. Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea to record yourself if you can, or listen to the recordings of your meetings because everything's being recorded, web streamed and recorded so you can listen back, Mm -hmm. um, which is torture. But then you can actually see or hear how, you know, what to improve, what to work on. I wanted to ask you if you, if anyone's watching and they're thinking, I really want to be an EU interpreter, what is the basic process that they need to go through? They would need to take a test, and that's it. Um, when you when you pass the EU test, you are accredited, and you're put on a list that the European Union institutions uh, look at when they need interpreters. To be invited to the test, you need to fulfil certain conditions. So you need a specific degree in interpreting, a conference interpreting degree. It can be a BA, but that's four years, not three years, Mm -hmm. or an MA. I'm just looking at my, um, I printed off a a page from the EU website, interpreting for the EU. Okay, I'll put a a link to that. Yeah, yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Excellent. Uh, Or a BA in any subject, but uh, you would need a postgraduate degree in conference interpreting. Or... That's another route. You would need some experience, 100 days um, experience in conference interpreting. Importantly, conference interpreting. Mm -hmm. So it can't be court interpreting or public service interpreting. Then you can get invited. You may get invited to the test depending on your language profile. Because for some language units or booths, as we call them, you need more languages. For some, you need fewer languages. Moving on, and I'm going to quote you, uh, on your LinkedIn profile, you say, I've worked for everyone from minors and dancers to world leaders and international negotiators. Can you tell us about one of your most memorable interpreting jobs? You would think that it might be working for or uh, interpreting, you know, figures or important personalities or stars like Barack Obama or mm-hmm. controversial figures like Nigel Farage. Mm-hmm. But to be honest, uh, what I really remember most is the slightly odd jobs or maybe subject matters that is a bit extraordinary or not something or a bit or a mundane where you wouldn't really expect them to need interpreters. So I worked. The dancers, it's the Irish dancers. I remember I worked at a press conference of an Irish 
um, dancer's uh, team. Mm-hmm. And I remember being invited to their show and it was just such an amazing experience. But that's, you know, that's something, you, okay, it's a press conference. But I remember I once worked for a, um, at a mime festival. Uh-huh. Um, lots of people ask me, okay, what are you going to do there? <laughs> yeah. <what? laughs> but, but, you know, there, there were introductions. There, were, yeah. there was lots and lots of <laughs> talking involved. So it wasn't just miming. And um, there are some assignments where, where you just, which you just remember because they were so important um for or for the world really mm-hmm. and you, you can't really talk about many of them because sometimes you just can't even say that you worked at a certain meeting but there are meetings that are public knowledge where you you know you read about them in the newspaper and sometimes you read your own words and I think the most memorable assignments were the ones when I interpreted during um, trials of war criminals mm-hmm. And there were there was a Polish witness, and I was working into English, and you you feel that you actually make a difference. As a final question, I'd like to just bring artificial intelligence into this. What what kind of impact is artificial intelligence having on your work? When I was um, involved in um, my volunteering work for the International Association of Conference Interpreters for the UK and Ireland chapter, uh, we did a series of webinars on AI and interpreting. And I remember one where we asked the audience whether they would be, whether they would welcome the availability of AI tools in the booth. Mm-hmm. 90%, 9-0 said that they would. So we are very much open to change, and this change can be very positive for us. If I can have software in my booth that helps me with numbers or just gives me you know, names that I may have missed, mm-hmm. uh, proper names of some tribe in a, in a corner of the world that I've never even heard of, mm-hmm. and I please, I, I want that. Mm-hmm. Give me that any day. AI... Really, when you think about machine interpretation, it all depends on the use case. So in some settings, using interpreters would be impractical. Uh, when you are uh, at an Airbnb in Italy or wherever, and uh, the host doesn't speak your language and they use an app, they wouldn't really have thought of employing an interpreter for that. I mean, you don't really need an interpreter to, to show you how to switch an oven, right? Um, <laughs> right. Or, uh, you know, it's just it's just not really practical, and it's just a five minute interaction where you don't really need any specialist to help you with with whatever. No. Yeah, and and no real no serious consequences from a misunderstanding. Exactly. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you may trigger a fire alarm, but <laughs> but no, no, exactly, no serious consequences. And there are some use cases for machine interpreting, and there are some clients who. Um, who you know don't want a human to work for them. That's fine. You know, you might let wish to let them go, or you might want to persuade them to use a human interpreter and and show them your value. And you may be surprised, um, but there are some companies now, uh, language service providers, who advertise themselves as providers of human interpretation mm-hmm. already. So they make this distinction which means that clients are looking for alternative solutions, which is fine. They're entitled to, and for some settings, it's fine. But we, as interpreters, need to show our value as humans. And I ne- I don't believe that we will be replaced fully, ever. Because for some settings, you just need a, non- a human, um, for even for security reasons sometimes, or because you need a... A human for because of I don't know um, relationships. I mean, you need this human touch, and um, heads of state or government might not be comfortable with a machine interpreting for them. That said, I don't know. I mean, at some point they might be, and even you know, I always thought that during that the European Parliament would never ever think about uh, employing machines. But you can't exclude that possibility at some point. I don't don't know. Honestly, it's just hard to tell. I 
don't think will be wiped out as a profession. Never. I guess, I mean, well, the thing is, it comes to the point of, well, if AI gets cleverer than humans, well, it's going to wipe out every profession. But based on the, um, you know, the current circumstances, I don't know. I mean, I, I actually did a translation for the EU a couple of weeks ago. And they had, they decided not to, I mean, they do sometimes use machine translation in them. The one I was on, they hadn't used it. And I would assume that's because they weren't getting the, whatever quality they were able to produce for it. It wasn't good enough to make it worthwhile to, you know, impose it, let, you know, let the translators draft. Um, and so seeing that that's still the case, well, it, it's a very, very long way from getting to the point where machine translation is replacing humans. Are, are you seeing AI being used in the booth? At yes. The moment. Well, I know that I I never do that. I don't do that. I've never done it yet. But I know that there there are, there are pieces of software helping you, and there are. Oh, actually, I do. But it's just for terminology management, but not in the book right. for preparation. You you actually do that. You use it. Um, and uh, but in the booth, I I don't use AI. But I know some colleagues um have used uh, some pieces of software supporting them in the booth and there are tests and I know that some are very successful but yeah I mean this is the kind of support that we need and if AI can help humans do their jobs better then that's the perfect use case I think. Yeah it actually sounds like it could really help reduce that preparation time you were talking about if it could yes. be pulling up some of the t voice rec if, if it could recognize what has been said correctly and then pull up that terminology for you then. Exactly. Absolutely, that, that would take the stress away a bit. Yes, it's it's all a matter of trust, really. If mm. if your client trusts the machine, or trusts the human, or just doesn't care, mm. or um, it's also a matter of of you know if it's a high level meeting, and what what are the stakes if you make a mistake, and also there is another thing. Sometimes interpreters can be sca scapegoats. You can blame the interpreter, and it's absolutely fine. This is part of the job. Uh, sometimes it's easier. You just say, okay, this might have been mistranslated, mm -hmm. um, and we're not really sure whether there have be has been miscommunication, and everybody looks at the interpreter, and that's fine. You just just swallow the pill and uh, get on with it. Whereas with the machine, I don't know. Could they just say, oh, the machine got... Yeah, they probably could. <laughs> they, could they could. The thing is, they could go back and analyse it all very closely. But I suppose they can with the recording for the interpreter. Exactly. We're always being <laughs> recorded. Well, mind you, the, you know, bilateral meetings between some presidents, for example, they, they would not be recorded mm -hmm. normally. So it's good because then you can blame the interpreter if yeah. something happens. <laughs> Skilliger is a is your company, which I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. Would you like to tell us a little bit about about Skilliger? It's a platform that helps you find um, training opportunities and CPD opportunity, continuous professional development opportunities. So events, courses, resources that you may otherwise not be even aware of. And this is for language professionals. Yes, it's for language professionals. It's not. You won't find uh, information about university programs for for you know for students, but um, young graduates or new interpreters or new translators will find uh, quite a lot of resources there, and events and courses. And uh, some of them are free, some of them are paid, and you can search for the things that interest you the most or might be you know might suit your needs, etc. And the idea is to basically make it easier for you to find opportunities like that. I sometimes include things that interpreters or translators might not find directly relevant for them. But there are things like, I don't know, a Latin American novel. Mm -hmm. uh, because some of us might actually be interested, and this is background yeah. knowledge, and um, there is quite a, quite a few. Um, there are quite a few uh, outfits offering free well-being sessions, you know, confidence, etc. And um, I wasn't even aware of them before I started Skilliga. And then colleagues um, gave me tips and suggestions, and people were sending in uh, their own ideas about what 
is useful, what isn't. And I'm really grateful to everyone involved. And I just wanted to say everyone can get involved. You know, you can send me tips and you don't even have to provide the details because on the website, skilliga.com, um, there is this button, add a listing, and you can use different, I mean, you can do it in different ways. I mean, you can even fill out a simple Google form, just giving me a link. Um, and if you wish to provide more details, then you can do it. And any feedback is appreciated. Obviously, this is all a work, work in progress and there are bugs and it needs improving. And, you know, that's that's just life because we do it in our spare time. Just to close this interview, I'm going to ask you the question that I ask everybody I interview, and that is, what is your message for early career linguists? First of all, I would say that when you start out, an early, you know, your early days may be difficult. I mean, this job is, is always difficult, but um, any job is, I suppose. But when you start out, there are so many things that you don't know you don't know. And it's great to have a support network of colleagues, of people that you can rely on, who can hold your hand, who can explain things. Uh, the business aspects, for example, because at university, um, most people I know um, said they didn't really learn about the business side of interpreting. You need to be a team player. Uh -huh. So just remember that. Uh, always be respectful, not just towards your clients, but your colleagues, technicians that help you with the equipment. You never know where your jobs come from. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of being a human being, obviously, but it's also part of being a good professional. You want good atmosphere in the booth. You don't want people to be sour, negative, angry, uh, disrespectful. It's really important because you're in a team. And in my case, most of my jobs used to come from colleagues, not mm -hmm. direct clients. And it's important. I mean, people just need to like you, like working with you. And it's not just about quality of your work, but also quality of you being a professional and human being. And the third thing I would say is be curious and never stop learning. Don't get discouraged. And um, think about your life and, and your life experiences as, as something that you can use professionally as well. Mm -hmm. So three things. Team player. Uh, don't know that you don't know so surrounding yourself with the right people asking for help and advice and being curious well that's all excellent advice and I do believe all of that advice is, is applicable to translation as well maybe in, in different contexts and probably to lots of other jobs thank you so much Monica for coming to talk to us and for sharing so much interesting information with us thank you for having me I hope you enjoyed this interview from the Translator's Studio. We specialise in teaching the art of translation and in preparing translators for certification through the DipTrans exam. If you like our content, please let us know by clicking on the subscribe button. See you in the next video.